Hi everyone, it's Emmanuel Kadosh. I wanted to invite you all to subscribe to ILTV Plus, where you can find our daily news and updates about Israel. And not only that, but live feeds, entertainment, our kosher food show, and so much more. Needless to say, your subscription to ILTV Plus helps us grow and create more content while also supporting the state of Israel. Our app is available on all platforms and devices, so I'll see you guys there. Hello and welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras and coming up in today's newscast, ballistic experts under U.S. supervision finally analyzed the bullet and rifle that allegedly killed Palestinian-American journalist Shirin Abu Akleh. The results expected today. Meanwhile, the various parties solidifying their rosters and campaign strategies ahead of the coming elections in November. Yeshatid Knesset member Moshe Tulpaz joining us to discuss. And later, the first surrogacy for a gay male couple in Israel underway, and this just months after the eligibility was expanded to include the LGBTQ plus community. The bullet said to have killed Palestinian-American journalist Shirin Abu Akleh now back in the hands of the Palestinian Authority, and this after Israeli experts under American supervision conducting ballistics reports in Jerusalem on Sunday. But the initial results are inconclusive. Despite the PA's assertions that Israel would not be involved in the investigation, Israeli ballistics experts now finishing with their analysis of the bullet that allegedly killed Al Jazeera journalist Shirin Abu Akleh. The round handed on Sunday to United States officials who then allowed Israeli experts to conduct their examinations to definitively conclude who the shooter was. And the exam, including the supposed IDF rifle that may have been involved, conducted at the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem under U.S. supervision, the PA reportedly refusing to send an expert of their own. As for the results, the United States reporting that initial conclusions are inconclusive, but it's likely that the shooter was in fact an IDF soldier. PA Justice Minister Mohammed al Shalalde agreeing that as Abu Akleh was a U.S. citizen, it's within the United States' rights to conduct a comprehensive and impartial investigation and that the PA will welcome it. Meanwhile, Israeli officials likewise saying that they'll accept the results of the test whichever way it goes. <laughs> But even if the IDF is found to be responsible, Israel rejecting the now widely spread accusations that the killing was in any way intentional. And the United States repeating this, saying that the shooting was not meant to kill. Despite clear press markings, Abu Akleh was killed by a bullet to the head during a firefight between IDF soldiers and Palestinian terror suspects in the Janin refugee camp. Until now, the PA refusing to hand over evidence related to the death or participate in joint investigations. Now, as we begin the campaign season ahead of fifth elections in November, Israeli Knesset parties locking in their policies and making last-minute changes to their rosters. Joining me with more is Yeshatid Party Knesset member Moshe Tulpaz. Knesset member, thank you very much for joining us. Now, first, you know, have you had a chance to congratulate our new interim prime minister, Yair Lapid? Yes, of course. I spoke with him just the day he was nominated. And he's uh, well into work, so, you know, he's very busy, but he had the time to, to thank me. And we were talking a few, uh, you know, very um, delicate issues we have to deal with him at the moment. Is he enjoying the new position or is there, you know, no time for that given the circumstance? I think uh, 10 years in politics, including mi two ministers and, you know, eight, another seven years as an MK head of opposition, have made him very ready and very, he, he comes to it with really, I think, 
a, a very mature, experienced politician. He's done many things in the other world and in, polit in politics. And I think he's, uh, he'll be an excellent uh, prime minister. All right, well, now we know that Lapid's main message was to operate as if there are no elections coming. Uh, is this his way of showing confidence that Yeshatid will stay in power? Uh, or is this a general campaign strategy to give the public a functioning government and show that a vote for Yeshatid is well spent? I think it's both. I think Lapid is very confident about the, our ability to form the next government. But his state of mind is, we're here, we have to do the job, let's do the best we can, and let's take elections, uh, put them aside. I mean, we're working on the elections, we want Yeshatid to be big and strong as a leading uh, coalition party, but we're, we're now with the hands on, on the, you know, on, on leading the country, so we have to lead it. And that's why he said what he said, put the elections aside, let's look not only for four months, but four years ahead, and I think that's the reason the ministers understood, uh, you know, the theme that he brought, uh, getting into prime minister um, post immediately. What do you think are the biggest challenges that are maybe facing the the interim coalition as it is uh, between now and November? Look, I, I come from the committee of, of foreign affairs and security, and there's always security issues. I mean, prime minister has to deal and not on an every day, every hour basis, with, uh, with all kinds of challenges. And he's now the number one with the Minister of Defense, Benny Gantz, and he has to make decisions on an every hour basis. So that's the main thing. Uh, second, and not least, I, I would say um, economics. We know we are, we're, we're in a world situation of prices going up, of a lot of mm -hmm. um, you know, aftershocks and intershocks of the war uh, in Ukraine. And that influences the whole world, including us. And we're very keen, very de deliberate to, to work on, uh, you know, taking costs down and um, promoting economics uh, very strongly. And that's something Lapid is very much into. Well, and so, I'd say the third thing is yeah. education. I mean, we're heading to a new educational year, 1st of September, and there's a lot to prepare. And I think Lapid will also influence very much the agreement between well, and there's also Minister there's of also of course the, the conflict between the uh, education field, the teachers and their unions, and the finance ministry, etc. So, you know, so speaking of some of these challenges, what do you hope to get done in the next few months, and what can you do given the lack of a majority, which is why the coalition dissolved to begin with? There's there are a lot of decisions that a prime minister can decide on any term. He doesn't need the Knesset for it, and I think Lapid. But then these are short, real, those, those are short-term solutions then, aren't they? Because if it's executive action, they can be undone in November. Look, there are lot, it's not November. November is elections. We won't form a government right. before January. So we're talking about six months, maybe more. Now, there are a lot of decisions to be made now. And I would say there are a lot of things that can't wait. I mean, we're, we're trying to pass the metro um, um, decision, which will build... 10 and 20 years ahead, the way that mm -hmm. all um, tra traffic will look like in uh, the center of the country. We, we managed, we wanted to pass the law, we couldn't, but we'll, we want to work on it even now. We're trying to get terms with the opposition on that and on a lot of other issues that we feel that the opposition isn't working towards the good of the country, but is only looking at the very sectorial part of work. And we're trying to open okay our minds and their minds to work together on the best things for the country. And well, that's what we need now. So speaking so speaking of the various parties, you know, if we're looking, there have been a lot of changes. Itamar Ben-Gvir uh, is splitting from his religious Zionism party. Moshe Feiglin is saying that he might rejoin Likud. Gantz and Saar say that they might unite under one banner, and, and there are others. Given the ongoing shifts, with whom or which parties do you think that you can sit in the next government? So, for first, I think we need a big, strong Yeshatid. We're looking at 25, many more mandates um, in order to have a strong party that can lead the coalition. Secondly, look, I think all, um, all parties uh, could be part of our coalition, except for the right wing, what they call Tzionut Datit. I call it extreme Datit, Kintzoniut Datit. 
and uh, the Meshutefet of the Arabs, which mm. won't be a part uh, in our coalition, but all the rest could be partners. We want to form a strong and very, you know, wide government in order to have another four years together. Right. And I think the country needs a strong government led by Yeshatid. So that's our main argue. We need a strong Yeshatid and a wide coalition with us. Knesset member Moshe Tulfaz, thank you again so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. The Israeli Supreme Court now unanimously ruling to overturn a quota limit on the number of Ukrainian refugees allowed in the country. And the move is overwhelmingly hailed by Ukrainian authorities. Initially set by Interior Minister Ayelet Shaked, a limit of accepting just 5,000 non-Jewish Ukrainian refugees was put in place. This to prevent a mass influx of refugees in the country, which authorities feared would overburden the system. But the Israeli Supreme Court now unanimously voting to overturn this limit, meaning Ukrainians will be able to travel to Israel for up to three months without any visa or special permissions, as it was before the Russian invasion began. Explaining their ruling, the court rejecting the state's assertions that those who arrive on the three-month visa would overstay their allowed visits. The court arguing that, in fact, by May 8th alone, some 4,409 Ukrainians who entered Israel had already left. Further, as of May 22nd, only some 36,600 Ukrainians had been counted in Israel, more than half of whom are Jews, eligible to stay indefinitely under the law of return. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, meantime, praising the ruling and commending the Supreme Court's decision to respect rule of law and human rights, adding that it's exactly what distinguishes a true and developed democracy. Now, with the tourism season upon us and COVID cases in Israel already seeing a spike, authorities are increasingly concerned that the pandemic may soon resurge and restrictions along with it. With me to discuss is director of the School of Public Health at Ben Gurion University, Professor Nadav Davidovich. Now, thank you so much for being with us, Professor. Prime Minister Lapid and uh, Health Minister Horowitz are expressing growing fears of what's to come. What's your take? COVID is with us, never actually left. Uh, we have a, a rise in the last uh, few months. Actually, we saw it uh, coming uh, already in the West uh, Water uh, Surveillance. And I think uh, that maybe the pendulum now moved uh, where we became uh, too passive. Uh, mm. I don't think, of course, that we need to return uh, to extreme measures as we had in the past. Uh, but uh, you can see what's going on now with vaccination rates. I think that's something we can invest much more. Um, this also means that uh, we need the healthcare workforce doing uh, the work uh, within uh, the communities, um, doing, being much more proactive uh, with vaccination. I think that uh, maybe we have no choice but to return uh, to masks, not just a recommendation, but maybe um, more so, especially in public transportation, uh, flights. And uh, probably the most important thing to remember that uh, winter is not so far from now. Uh, there is already right. a burden on the hospitals and we need to reinforce our healthcare system. People are, are overwhelmed. Uh, there's burnout. I think that the use of masks uh, need to be uh, much more uh, prevalent. And I think we need to reinforce our healthcare system um, because uh, just yesterday I spoke uh, with Professor Hezi Levy in a different matter, and uh, they see in Barzilai and also in many other hospitals, uh, you know, um, lots of uh, cases that are now going to interfere with uh, uh, the treatment of uh, COVID. So the first barrier, of course, is prevention in the community. And I think that we became very passive. Now, preparing for the winter is crucial because we're going to have uh, um, not just COVID, but also other upper respiratory infections. And there's a whole uh, link between, you know, having a strong uh, laboratory system. Uh, we need to see what is going to be our surveillance. Uh, we have the wastewater, but uh, we can go like uh, we're doing for influenza every year mm -hmm. to have sentinels. All of these things are not decided yet, and uh, we should uh, uh, start uh, uh, planning because the, the winter is going to be probably quite rough, unfortunately. All right, so there are currently at least 100,000 active infections in Israel, and the spread rate is 1.07. Uh, but still, most Israelis are twice, if not three to four times vaccinated, and serious cases remain relatively low, as I said before. 
At what point do you think that we might need to be concerned enough to in, 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 uh, enact real restrictions, or will we, you know, ideally, in your mind, not get there, not get that far? I don't think we need to get there unless it'll be really, you know, uh, a very, very violent uh, variant. I think uh, that what we need to do is being proactive with vaccine, as I said. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still uh, uh, people that didn't get the third dose. Uh, I think we need to invest there because people that never got even the first dose, uh, it will be hard to, uh, you know, to get them right. there. But uh, those who got the second one and why not getting the third, sometimes it's a matter of access. Um, I think that like we're doing in the Negev, working with the Bedouin community, for example, and uh, others, that's uh, the main uh, key. And investing in the healthcare uh, system, including the community and hospitals, uh, because uh, I must tell you, talking, we're doing research, uh, talking with uh, nurses and physicians, uh, they're all uh, overworked. Uh, and uh, we need to take uh, the Israeli healthcare system and bring it into a different uh, level. And also remembering the long COVID is with us and there are gaps according to socioeconomic status. Uh, many of right. the post-COVID, long COVID uh, uh, clinics were closed and that's also something to consider. All right, Professor Davidovich, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you, lots of health. There are other things in COVID, but we can prepare for all of them if we are smart. Good news now for would-be parents in Israel's LGBTQ community as the country's first surrogate pregnancy on behalf of a gay male couple now underway. ILTV's Kayla Everlin with the details. Just a few months after surrogacy made available to same-sex couples in Israel, the first gay couple to take advantage of this option being reported. A central Israeli couple in their 30s sharing with Israeli media that their child is on the way. This, as preliminary checkups conducted early June, showing that the embryo has successfully transferred to the surrogate mother. Until recently, same-sex couples wishing to adopt or find surrogates were forced to travel abroad, which is not only far more expensive, but also more complicated, as couples would have to deal with both Israel and another country's healthcare and legal systems. But now, full equality for parenthood extended before the law, and dozens of same-sex couples and even single men, are approved for the process here at home. The only problem remaining then is one of supply and demand, experts expecting a boom in demand for surrogacy, and a coming shortage of surrogate mothers in the light of Israel's relatively small population. Now every year, tens of thousands of students from all over the world come to Israel to advance their studies, but this is mostly at the university level. So for high schoolers looking to get a leg up on their college admissions, or just generally gain an amazing education abroad, there's the Jewish National Fund USA's Alexander Muss High School in Israel, or AMHSI. Joining me with more is AMHSI's board member, Joel Reinstein, and two students in the program right now, Mia Finvarb and Joshua Dubrinsky. Thank you guys so much right now for being with us. Thank I'm you. so excited to talk to you. Uh, Josh, Mia, I'll actually start with you guys. You know, what, what brought you to uh, Alexander Muss and, and to Israel in general? So, um... My mom and my dad both attended Alexander Muss High School in Israel. And so then my brothers both did, did it as well. And it's kind of a tradition in my family. And your legacy. Yeah. And so <laughs> obviously like that was um, a main reason why I came. But I also love Israel. I've come twice before to see both of my brothers and pick them up. Um, and I just wanted honestly to discover Israel on a different level, you know, like learn more, go into more detail, like more in depth and learn like where I come from, you know, like my roots. I think it's very interesting. It's always been a passion of mine, like in school and outside of school, just, you know, to learn. Josh? And then I heard about this through friends and I never had any family come, but I wanted to find more about myself and more about this country that I didn't get to learn the first time I came here. Okay, so, you know, what do you hope to gain from your experience in general? I mean, I, I know you touched on that a little bit. Uh, Josh, you want to you wanna add a little bit? Yeah, so I felt really disconnected with my Jewish roots mm -hmm. just because I never learned about it in school or anywhere at home. So I wanted to learn more about the country and its history, but also like who I am on the inside too. Okay. Joel, I want to bring you in to the conversation here. You know, what about these programs uh, or with AMHSI in general do you think uh, resonated with you and got you involved uh, to become a board member? 
Uh, it what happened quite some time ago. Um, I've been involved with um, the high school in Israel for many years, and uh, it's all because of my children, uh, who all three of them went to high school in Israel, and uh, their connection, how they felt about Israel after attending the program was um, dramatically different than what they understood before they came to Israel. They just, they fell in love with the country, they fell in love with uh, the kids in the program, and uh, the end result is they've really stayed connected um, with the Jewish people in many ways, um, both the community, um, uh, activities in the community, and um, I, I really think a lot of it is because of Mus. Uh, it just did an amazing job of giving them an experience of a lifetime. So, all right, speaking of, I want to come back to you guys. Mia, we'll start with you. Other than the school, you know, what, what, how are you occupying your time? Where are you going out and seeing the country? Are you, uh, I don't know, what, what are you, what are you do, finding here? So, honestly, of course, like the learning and the TUOs, like the, the trips we, we go on, like that's amazing. But also, it's truly like a pre-college program to me because, I mean, we're in dorms. We're, we're honestly very, like, it's very independent. So when we have sign-out times, for example, we'll have two and a half hours to sign out. My friends and I go out in the town. We go get food. We just explore everywhere. We obviously have boundaries. So, like, we obviously explore, like, all around. We'll go one way or the other. We do our laundry together. I mean, it just seems so, like... I've always is this all is is laundry on campus or are you going no like, like into the I city well, I I, 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 I go in, yeah we went to go find a laundromat just <laughs> honestly for the experience like we just wanted to see how it was you know like I've never experienced something so like on my own you know and not only on my own like I have friends who are in the same boat so coming here was just like a whole new experience for me and I think the the independent part of it is so important just like honestly to prep me for college and just being in this country and exploring that and, and being on my own is just so important for growth, like in general. So Josh, you know, si similar question. And what do you find maybe most surprising or interesting about, about being here? I go to a bunch of like the local parks around and just seeing how friendly everyone is. And like sure. they play ping pong with us. They go on the swings with us. And just how friendly everyone is and inviting and wants to teach us like Hebrew and wants to teach right. us what they do. Are you doing like the, the Israeli uh, like matkot ping pong or like ping pong ping pong? I think ping pong ping pong. <laughs> That's stuff I'm used hitting to. The, hitting the beach now? Yeah. All right. Joel, you know, coming back to you again, what, what do you find to be the most uh, inspiring thing about, about this school and, you know, what do you really truly hope that students will take away from it? I hope that they'll um, really get a feeling for uh, this country. Um, it's uh, something that they'll really need when they're back in the United States. They need to have a, a depth of feeling and understanding because uh, campuses around the United States are really tough places to be. And with the love of Israel and with an understanding of, of really what life is like in Israel, um, I think um, they have the tools to really deal with life going forward, especially on, on campuses where they're meeting people that don't understand um, yes, what's happening here. Absolutely. So. All right, well, I'm glad that uh, you guys are here and having this experience, especially, you know, as Joel said, to go back and take that with you, uh, be ambassadors for Israel, so they say. Joel, Mia, Josh, thank you all so much for, for joining us again. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies expected around the region this evening with uh, lows ranging from 18 to 24 degrees Celsius or 65 to 60, 75 Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, the weather remaining much the same as the past few days with more clear and sunny skies and top temperatures of 35 degrees Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit. Very hot again. All right, that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel and around the world, check out our website at ILTV.TV. You can subscribe to our newsletter and join us on our streaming platform at ILTV+. And you can catch that across all of your devices. I'm Aaron Porras. Be well, and thank you so much for watching.
everyone, it's Emmanuel Kadosh. I wanted to invite you all to subscribe to ILTV Plus, where you can find our daily news and updates about Israel. And not only that, but live feeds, entertainment, our kosher food show, and so much more. Needless to say, your subscription to ILTV Plus helps us grow and create more content while also supporting the state of Israel. Our app is available on all platforms and devices, so I'll see you guys there.